So we're continuing on the theme that we saw in this morning's passage in 1 Samuel 24, the idea of vengeance. And we saw that David insists that vengeance is the Lord's. And Paul picks up that same idea in Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 9 to 21. Romans chapter 12, and this evening Barry will read for us. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for your word. And as we open up this passage, we ask that you will open up our hearts, that we might be soft and responsive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, that we might take steps together in this next half an hour along the path towards godliness. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, sometimes on a Sunday, I like to imagine lots of different congregations gathering in God's name all over the world. I like to imagine what they look like and what it would be like to join with them in worshipping God together. In Australia, of course, they're, they're heading to bed or they're already in bed at this point in the day. In parts of America, they have only just woken up and they are getting ready to begin their worship of the Lord on this Lord's Day. And everywhere in between, God's people have been gathering and lifting up their praises to him. People who are brothers and sisters in Christ, people who we will one day meet in glory, even though they might be on the other side of the world right now, gathering in a building that we will never even see let alone step in. Uh, We will one day gather with them in glory. Try this with me for a moment, okay? This is like my my Sunday morning exercise as I pray for God's people. Picture for a moment in your mind churches in lots of different locations around the world from lots of different backgrounds made up of lots of different types of people, uh, different ethnicities and different cultures, different styles of dress and song and service structure, but nevertheless meeting around this same great book, the very word of God, gathered around God's word. And then I like to picture, if I can let you into my slightly strange mind for a moment, I like to picture zooming out from all these congregations, a kind of world map, and it's it's dark except for where there is a congregation meeting. And there there is like a little pinprick of light. And so there's a little pinprick of light here in Moordown, and by God's grace, lots of other ones across Bournemouth and across the UK as well. And we'd long for many more, but we are grateful for the ones that there are. And then across Asia and across Africa and America. And then think of some of those darker places in the map, places where perhaps it is extraordinarily difficult to be a Christian, extraordinarily difficult to gather together, at least, as part of God's people. And I think you'd be delighted to find that even in those places, there are still some pinpricks of light 
as little congregations gather together today to worship our great God. North Korea, for example, little pinpricks of light here and there as twos and threes and maybe on occasion a few more are hunkered down in a house church somewhere, curtains drawn for fear of being seen or perhaps hiding in a basement or an attic and someone reads God's word and somebody prays and somebody proclaims the truths that we love and if they feel up to it, if their courage can bear it, they might even sing a few verses quietly together. I like to imagine the churches that have sung perhaps a song that we have sung today, their voices mingled with ours being heard in heaven. The great diversity of circumstances facing these various churches around the world. And I like to imagine the thousands and thousands of churches which are no doubt studying the same passage as us as well. Given that there are millions of Christians, hundreds of thousands of church gatherings, uh, this passage being particularly popular, no doubt there are many studying Romans chapter 12, just by virtue of the, the numbers. And some of those churches, in very different contexts to our own, are facing all kinds of pressure and persecution, the likes of which we mercifully could hardly even imagine. Some of our brothers and sisters today, no doubt, will gather around scraps of scripture, and they would be able to think of very real examples They would be able to think of names of brothers and sisters, of people who have been persecuted, carted off, perhaps even killed for their faith. They could relive for you stories of people they've seen dragged out of homes to be murdered for saying the same things that we so easily, but almost unthinkingly say here in Mordown without any fear of repercussion. And they, as they study Romans chapter 12 today, they will read these same words. But you see that they will sound um, especially lively, especially vital in their context. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. And so while those words are true in both contexts, in theirs and in ours, for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan and North Korea and Somalia and Libya, those words have a particular meaning, don't they? They are especially powerful and potent. Let me read some of the especially applicable verses to this idea of vengeance, responding to evil with evil. Verse 14, we read, Bless those who persecute you. Can you imagine? Bless and do not curse. Then 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. This is exactly in line with David's attitude this morning, isn't it? Uh, When he was confronting King Saul when they had come out of the cave. Do you remember what he said? From evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. You won't catch me doing to you what you have done to me. Here Paul says, Christian, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. Now again, that's not always possible, is it? It takes two sides for there to be genuine peace in a relationship. But if it is possible, and as far as it does depend upon you, Christian, be peaceful. So there is a great conflict between David and Saul, but that conflict, as we saw, is all going in one direction. If it depended on David, there would be peace. Now listen to this. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Do you remember David saying to Saul, may the Lord judge between you and me? And may the Lord avenge the wrongs that you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. That is a a perfect example of this New Testament bit of theology. Paul and David are on exactly the right page there with how to respond to the horrors of sin that we see in the world. David doesn't dismiss the sin and say, it doesn't matter, Saul. No, it matters. It really does matter. If the sin is not repented of, the sin will receive God's wrath. That much is clear. David simply says, it's just not my place to pour out that wrath upon you. Paul says the same. 
Notice then in the text, there is no wiggle room here. There's no room for negotiation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. But what about this particular person who really does deserve it? No, (laughs) don't repay anyone evil for evil. But I'm just so angry at what that person has done. No, do not repay anyone, anyone evil for evil. Then verse 19, do not take revenge. It's a command, isn't it? Do not take revenge, my dear friends. You see that language is both tough and wonderfully tender. There is no compromise. Do not take revenge, but it's compassionate. My dear friends. Paul refers to his readers here as my dear friends. Paul, the writer, knows what it is like to suffer at the hands of evil people, doesn't he? Of course he does. And these Christians in Rome, my goodness, they have lived through times of great pressure and persecution And they are about to live through more as well. It's thought that this letter was written about 57 AD. Don't ask me quite how they figured that out. And the great fire of Rome, 63 AD, I think. So that will be blamed on the Christians and they will be punished on account of it. So just a few years around the corner, just unbelievable persecution is headed for these very Christians here in Rome. If you were part of that church in Rome, then you would know people who have been carted off to the Colosseum to be slain for sport and spectators. You will know people who have been crucified on account of their faith. You will know people who have been lit up like torches at the garden parties of Emperor Nero because they claim the name of Christ. If you are a Christian in Rome, you will know what it is like to have suffered horrendously at the hands of evil people. Now, Paul is not dismissing their suffering for a moment, and God doesn't dismiss it either, but nevertheless, he says... Do not repay anyone evil for evil, and do not take revenge, my dear friends. Now, a couple of things to point out quickly about what the text is not saying, okay? So the text is not saying that we ought to do away with the importance of any earthly justice or discipline or consequences for sin in this life. This is talking about one person's retribution against another primarily, Within certain structures, there is accountability and judgment and justice. Here are the three main structures ordained by God. The home and the church and the nation. And all those three things are established by God. And in all those three contexts, there is an an element of discipline, loving discipline, even judgment in some cases. But it's never just personal retribution, me versus you. So in the home, for example, parents exercise discipline, loving discipline, but they ought to exercise discipline for their children. If they love them, they will, in fact. So there'll be consequences for actions. Even in the church, this makes us feel a little uncomfortable, doesn't it? But the Bible is very clear that elders ought to hold members accountable. There ought to be the exercise of loving church discipline on occasion and when necessary. So an elder ought to be able to sit somebody down and say, my friend, and it is my friend, but you claim the name of Christ and you go on living like this and it cannot continue in this way. For the glory of God, for the sake of your own soul, something needs to change here. So there are consequences for sin in the home, in the church, and even in the nation. Uh, The government has the right to enact judgment against criminals. That's not to say that a government cannot be corrupt or that a government cannot get it wrong. But either way, they have the right under God to administer justice. So to be clear, the passage is not saying there ought to be just no consequences for sin. Everybody gets away with everything all the time. It is simply saying there must be no personal retribution, no revenge, no violence from one person against another. And the scriptures give a very specific reason for it. It's not because it's not very nice. (laughs) What is the reason? Have a look there in Romans chapter 12. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. Why? Because their sins are not very serious. That's not what it says. Do not take revenge. Why? Because your suffering is not really that significant. You're blowing it out of proportion. (laughs) That's not what the text says either. No, your suffering is hugely important to God. Sin is hugely significant to God. It always is. But you should not be the one to avenge that sin committed against you. And here's why. Because God will. Because God will, and that's a promise. 
Leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. That's a promise from God, perhaps a promise we don't like to claim and quote very often, but it's a promise from God, I will avenge, says the Lord. Now let's spend a moment thinking about the wrath of God. Uh, This is a nice cheery subject, isn't it, for a, a sunny summer Sunday afternoon. This is a doctrine that makes Christians uneasy, and it's understandable, but I don't think it should. I don't think it should. Now, we know that it'll be misunderstood by the world. We know that the wrath of God will not be looked upon favorably by the world, of course, for the same reason that very few convicted criminals think well of the justice system. (laughs) We are sinners, aren't we? We have a vested interest in thinking that God is too harsh in his dealing of judgment. Why? Because we are on the receiving end of it. We are the ones who are guilty. Our opinion on the matter really can't be trusted, though. We're biased in our own favor. God is not too harsh by definition because he's God. He gets it exactly right every time. He is absolutely appropriate in the amount of wrath that he pours out. He does not give an ounce more punishment than is deserved, and he is not an ounce more lenient than he ought to be. Otherwise, justice will not have been done, and it must be done for his integrity. Wrath is one of the major themes in the book of Romans. You might remember remember last year, uh, Wayne preached a sermon on Romans chapter 3. He spoke specifically on, on the righteousness of Jesus, which turns away the wrath of God that we all deserve. The whole book just gravitates around that theme. So from the very first chapter, let me pick out a few examples. It cannot be ignored. Chapter 1, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. (laughs) Goodness me, Paul. That's how he opens his letter, by the way. Not very winsome, you might think. Not very evangelistic. Who's going to come back for a second hearing of that sermon? Chapter 2. Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Same chapter, he goes on to say, for those who are self-seeking and reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Next chapter, chapter three, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? Certainly not. If that were so, How could God judge the world? In chapter 4, we read that the law brings wrath. This is not especially cheery, is it? It's all a bit dark and a bit gloomy. Isn't there any hope? (laughs) Isn't there any kind of wriggle room to get out from underneath this wrath? Well, not wriggle room, (laughs) but rescue room, yes. There is redemption room, and we'll come to that in just a moment. In chapter 5, we read, speaking of Christians now, of course, Since we have been justified by Jesus' blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? We deserve God's wrath, all of us. But because we have trusted in Jesus, we have been saved and we will be spared the wrath of God. That freedom, that salvation, that forgiveness, that redemption, that great rescue from all the consequences of our sins, that is available to all people. All people, anyone who wants to be saved can be saved, but all who do not take the rescue will receive the wrath. It is one or the other. In chapter 9, what if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? Again, that is a verse that refers to people who reject Jesus as objects of God's wrath. In chapter 12, as we're studying uh, these words that are both kind of confronting and wonderfully comforting at the same time, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. And then the final instance in the book of Romans is in chapter 13. We read about uh, governments authorized to bring wrath, that is punishment, upon those who have done what is wrong. And so the wrath of God is, is not Christianity's dark little secret. <laughs> it's hardly a secret at all. It is all over the book of Romans. It is all over the Gospels. It is at the very heart of what we believe. 
This too is an extension of God's goodness. Would you believe it? I had one pastor say this week, we sometimes think of the wrath of God as though it's God's dark side. (laughs) But God doesn't have a dark side, does he? Because he is God. God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. Because God loves what is right, he must punish what is wrong. It must be removed from his holy presence. If we don't see things the same way as him, well, maybe it's because we ourselves are sinful and we are blinded by our own sin. So God must punish what is wrong because he loves what is right. God must avenge the sins committed against his people because he loves his people. It flows out of his love, out of his goodness, out of his holiness. So as I say, wrath is not some dark secret and it's not some fringe issue that can be ignored in Christianity. It is at the very heart of salvation. Some um, so-called Christians will attempt to be more loving than God, which is an awkward thing to try and do. And so they will downplay the seriousness of sin and the judgment of God, perhaps in an effort to make Christianity a bit more palatable. And it's an understandable impulse, of course, but it's, it's misguided at best, if not deliberately deceptive. You couldn't read the book of Romans and come away with any other impression than the fact that wrath is coming for those who do not turn from their sin. It is an incredibly serious thing. Uh, Those kinds of Christians will still talk about being saved, to which we'd have to ask, saved from what? (laughs) Saved from the wrath of God that is righteously being poured out upon all those who deserve it. The wrath of God, the Bible says, which is deserved and is coming because of God's own holiness and because of his love for all that is right and good and pure and true. Because of his love for justice, the wrath of God is coming. Because of his great love for his people, he has made a way by which you and I might be saved. So here's the promise. The punishment will be poured out, but here is the good news. It need not land on you. Such is the love of this great God. The gospel is just the most incredible news once you've understood the bad news. And without the bad news, it makes very little sense at all. It is incredible that Jesus would willingly stand in your place and receive the wrath that your sins deserve so that you can go free, so that you can get out from under the wrath that you so rightly deserve. It is amazing that Christ would save us from the consequences of our sin. I know I've quoted it before, but I love this little bit in uh, the story, The Life of Pi. Uh, The main character, Pi Patel, that grows up in a Hindu background. So he's familiar with the idea of lots of gods and they get up to all kinds of um, skirmishes together. But he's just beginning to understand something of Christianity. But he can't get his head around the cross. It's the one thing that confuses him more than anything else. Listen to this, he says, I couldn't imagine the Lord Krishna consenting to be stripped, naked, whipped, mocked, dragged through the streets and to top it off, crucified and at the hands of mere humans to boot. I'd never heard of a Hindu God dying. It is wrong. Why would God wish that upon himself? Why not leave death to the mortals? Why make dirty what is beautiful and spoil what is perfect? Yeah, (laughs) that's exactly right. It's asking exactly the right questions in that novel. It it defies all logic. It, It is mercy that is not based on our merit. It goes far beyond what we could ever begin to deserve. It is a gift of his grace. To answer that question of why, well, the answer is love. And that is the reason Jesus gives. So the wrath of God is coming, which shows the good news to be what it really is. Tremendously good news. Now, if you have a a deep appreciation of the wrath of God, well, suddenly it frees you up from the need to enact vengeance on anybody in the world. Think of this. If you say to yourself, this person has wronged me, or perhaps even worse, this person has harmed somebody that I love, and I'm so torn up about it, I'm so angry because of it, I must have vengeance. What are you saying there? Whether you verbalize it or not, what are you saying? You're saying, I don't believe that God cares as much as I care. I don't believe that God is as capable as I am capable 
of bringing judgment upon this situation. I don't believe that God loves this victim as much as I love this victim. And so I, in all my infinite wisdom and power, I ought to step in and sort this situation out. Well, obviously that's all wrong, isn't it? If what we've just read is true, that God will pour out wrath against sin. Clearly, God cares about sin way more than you care about sin. It grieves his heart way more than it grieves your heart. God loves that victim way more than you love that victim. And God will see to it that justice is done. We can be sure of it because he knows exactly what justice truly looks like in a way that you simply do not. And so again, verse 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Do you remember last year when we studied at Genesis chapter 34, and we thought about the story of Jacob's daughter, Dinah, and we saw how she was defiled, how she was abused and attacked and raped by a man called Shechem. And her brothers were beyond enraged, weren't they? Do you remember? Do you remember what they did in response? They were so incensed, so angry, they decided to kill the entire city that Shechem belonged to, and so vent their anger at what had happened. That was their vengeance brought to bear on that situation. Now, I think we would say that we understand their anger. There's even an element of righteousness in that anger, but their action was wrong. Their fury was misguided and misplaced. They are not more angry about that sin than God is angry about that sin. And they are not more capable of judgment than God is capable of judgment. And so in their anger, They sinned horrifically, and more innocent people suffered and were slain because of it. Jacob, at the end of that passage, wisely pointed out that that very action was bound to bring its own consequences. It would make them detestable among the nation. They were bound to be killed because of it, and we read that they would have been, were it not for the grace of God, sparing them. They were just playing a part in this endless cycle of vengeance and violence, and humans have a horrible habit of getting stuck in these cycles among themselves. Those who have been seriously wronged, those who have felt the grief and the shock and the anger, the righteous anger of being on the receiving end of somebody else's sin, need this word of comfort that God sees and God knows and God takes it extraordinarily seriously and no sin goes unpunished. And so that is the truth that you need to hold on to when you know that you have been wronged. That is the truth that David held on to this morning when he knew that he had been wronged by King Saul. It was not his position to bring forth justice or judgment on another individual. That role belongs to God. So although David has been seriously wronged and the more wrongs are coming as well around the corner, he has determined that he will only do what is right and he will leave justice to God. Uh, Paul calls for the same attitude now in Romans chapter 12 for you and for me and obeying this command, and it is a command, it flows out of faith in who God is and what he has promised to do. So in so many ways, it is a question of trusting God's timing as we've been seeing over the last few weeks. That these things will happen and I don't need to drag the judgment of God into this present moment and enact it on this particular person. I need to trust that God will do what is right. As Proverbs 20 verse 22 says, Do not say, I'll pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord, and he will avenge you. You hear that language of waiting for the Lord. It's the language of patience, trusting his timing. And so the ability to obey this command flows out of faith in who God really is. Instead, and in the meantime, between now and Judgment Day, it is our responsibility to bless, even to bless those who curse us. Now this is counter-cultural Christianity, isn't it? Back in Romans chapter 12 for the last couple of verses. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, to be clear, I don't think this is a kind of deceptive or double-minded kindness. You're not thinking to yourself, I'll tell you what, I'd really like some burning coals to be heaped on his head, and therefore come here and have this lovely glass of water. 
That's not at all what is being spoken of here. This is a euphemism for shame, that idea of burning coals on someone's head. You will make them ashamed of the way they treated you if you respond to their cruelty with the kindness and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen this in recent weeks, this very same attitude of overcoming evil with good. You remember the story of Stephen and how he was slain, how he was stoned to death. And we saw, even in that moment, as an evil thing was taking place, he was able to overcome evil with good and so heap burning coals on the heads of those who had done it. Do you remember what Stephen said as he died? Let me read it. He said, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, which is a parallel, by the way. Who is he imitating here? The Lord Jesus Christ. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then Stephen says, he fell on his knees, he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them, which sounds remarkably like, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And in that moment, as Stephen imitates the Lord Jesus Christ, he is overcoming evil with good. And we see how Stephen's prayer was wonderfully answered in the Apostle Paul and perhaps many others beside, but most notably in him. And we see how Jesus' prayer is answered in the centurion who saw the cruelty and the kindness and responded in faith. And of course, how millions of others have seen the same thing On the cross of Christ. Let me close by reading these words from 1 Peter chapter 2. If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. And so I am sure, friend, that that many of you have been wronged. And all of you will be wronged at some point in your life. Christ's example and his instruction is clear. Dear friends, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that this is so often so much easier said than done. So often we want to retaliate. We want retribution. We want vengeance on those who have sinned against us. Will you help us to trust you? We pray now especially for brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering for the cause of Christ. Will you give them strength? For those perhaps who have studied this same passage today, will you give them insight? We pray for them as we pray for ourselves that we'll be able to to put into practice all the things that we've thought about together this evening. That when we are on the receiving end of somebody else's sin, we will not sin against them. We pray that our kindness might lead perhaps even to their conversion. So we ask these things for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.